Hey guys, if you're watching this tutorial today, it means you're probably curious about how to learn the basics of Cinema 4D. Let's get started. So first of all, you've opened up Cinema 4D and you're very confused at how many options there are on what you can and cannot do. So let's start basics. First, go to File, say New Project, Save As, and navigate to wherever you want to save your project. Now what I like to do is make two folders within your project folder. One of them for renders and the other itself for the actual project file. This way you can keep your project file separate from your separate from your end renders which can be very confusing and it's an integral part of file management. So for the sake of this tutorial I'm just going to call this file test number one. Now when you open it up you'll end up with this default layout. There's actually a multitude of different kinds of layouts that you can choose. There's animation, which is concerning itself mostly with keyframing. There's BP 3D paint, which is for intense texture designing, and that goes to BB, BP UV edit as well. Modeling and sculpting are both for intense polygonal work, which is for designing specific shapes. Let's say you want to turn a circle into an even something as simple as an oval, because this does not come with an oval built in. <laughs> Um, and there's also Visualize, which is practically similar and pretty much the same as Startup. So for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just going to stick with Startup. Now you've got your about eight basic tabs here that you can use. And then you've got about ten more or so with more complicated things in them. So for the sake of this tutorial, again, I'm going to stick with the basics. You have your shapes under this little cube thing right here. You've got cubes, cones, cylinders, spheres, landscapes, which are really cool, and platonics, which you can change the shape of. So let's just stick with the cube. You've got y'all, but you've also got splines, which I can explain which I'll explain in a later tutorial. You've got your spline effects, which is just nerves. You've got all a whole bunch of complicated things. And then you've got individual animations which you can apply to shapes. And then you've got your stage gear, which is floors, physical skies, backgrounds, and such. You've got your cameras, which we should actually make right now. And then you've got your lighting. So what your camera is, all this is, is just what we record your render with. How to move this around, or anything actually, is when you click one, it's just a pan, simple pan. Two is zooming, and number three is orbiting the object. This is this is for keys on your keyboard. So let's go over that again. One, hold down your one key, will pan. Two will zoom, and three will orbit your object. Now it's imperative to know that when you hold three and you want to orbit your object, you need to have this cursor right here in Cinema 4D on the object you want to orbit. There's also secondary controls up here, which are I tend to use more often, but it's probably easier to use the keyboard. And then you have your more intense controls, which you can view from the individual axes, uh, axes, axi. <laughs> you've, then you've got your individual transformations, T for scaling, which is just changes the size of the object. You've got your E for transforming, which lets you move it along with the three basic axes, X, Y, and Z. And then you've got your R for rotating, which allows you to rotate it on the three basic axes as well. If you also want to transform something on a non-linear axis, you can just grab it anywhere that's not on one of these three colored lines and move it around. Now let's say you want to have the object follow a set number, like let's say if you want to have this rotate perfectly to 90 rather than having some decimal place, what you want to do is you come to this little magnet right here and you go to enable quantizing, quantizing. and what this allows you to do is it moves objects in increments of 10s, it rotates in increments of 10s, and it scales up and scales down in increments of 10, which I tend to use a lot. There's also tertiary controls for that as well within the object itself. So you click the object here and you've got four tabs here. You don't need to concern yourself with Fong at the moment. That's some complicated stuff there. 
but you've got your basic tab which is your name you've got your coordinates you've got your this is the actual position this is the scale and this is the cool and this is the rotation so I'm just gonna set all this back to zero And then you've got the object in depth, which is the size, and I'll just set all these to 400. Now that you've got a basic cube set up, what you want to do is you're going to come to Edit Render Settings. This is important to actually saving your project. So the normal definition I use is 1280 by 720 pixels. gosh and you can change centimeters millimeters inches but stick with pixels it's a lot easier and then you can also change what frames you want to render from frames is how they measure the scale of time when you're in this if you guys are familiar with video editing software you know what a frame is so normally you should have all frames and usually set it to 300 frames down here in this little bar right here because 300 frames is about 10 seconds worth of video <laughs> now that you've got in your output selected you need to select your save area so come here and you can select your different type of uh, output you want you can have pictures uh, PNGs JPEGs and you can also have movies and a whole bunch of other things so for the sake of this tutorial I'm just gonna do a movie and then you come to the file we'll just click this little dot 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 and you go to your save location now this is why I said you should make two folders before. One for your project files, the other for your renders. So just name your project and save this and have the output in your render folder. And now that we're done with that, we don't need to worry about it anymore. Oh, one more thing. These three options, you don't need to concern yourself with any of that yet, except anti-aliasing. Make sure you turn that to none, because anti-aliasing adds a lot of render time. Now you've got two options right here one of this one of these is a quick render view which just renders this little area you have in here and then you've got a render to picture viewer this is more CPU intensive than an, another option which I'm going to show you in a bit but for now we'll just have this little cube here so you've got your camera ready and what you do is you click this little icon next to this <laughs> And what this does is, this is your camera for the project. This is how it renders. This is the camera it views the project from. So now that we've got our camera activated, we'll go over keyframing. Normally, what I like to do is I go into my normal view outside of my camera when I turn on keyframing so that I don't accidentally move the camera to some place I don't want it to. Now, there's two options for keyframing down here. You've got you've got an active keyframing selection which records a keyframe for that specific frame and then you've got auto keyframe which I normally just have on so at frame 0 I'm gonna have my camera start out here and at frame 100 I want it to end up 1000 centimeters further back I can also change the transformations in my cube within with keyframing so at frame 0, it's 400 centimeters by 400 by 400. I can change its position with keyframing. So at it's at the coordinates right now are 0, 0, 0. Let's say at 100, I want it to move 300 centimeters this way. What it'll do is it'll move 300 centimeters this way at keyframe 100. These are also right here. These are your basic um, fast forward rewind frame by frame selections and your play selections this these two options are also this goes between keyframes so that's a, that's easy if you don't know where you have an object keyframed at you can also keyframe the scale of an object so let's say at frame 200 I want it to increase 200 percent on the y-axis and lastly but not least you can transform it on the rotation axis so let's say at frame 300 I want it to move 90 degrees on the Y on the um, Y 
and all coupled together, you get this. Normally, what I like to do is before I touch, even activate this camera, I turn off keyframing as a failsafe, and then I turn on the camera and view it. And then if I want to keyframe again, I'll exit out of the camera and turn on keyframe again. Normally, just as, even as a further preventative of failsafe, I make a backup camera. And this doesn't really affect render time because cameras are cameras. Nothing really happens with them. So let's talk about floors and skies and, and foregrounds and backgrounds. Floors are the easiest things to add. What it does is it just provides a floor. For, and another thing is quick render view. If you want to do a quick render preview in this screen right here, it's Command R. And it may look like this little plane right here is finite, but it actually extends into infinity on both the X and Z axis, as you can see here. And there's also a background. There's also skies and physical skies, which I'll discuss in a later video. Now let's talk about lighting. There's many different types of lights. There's natural sunlight, there's infinite light, which essentially generates light without regards to any physical object in the scene. So if I have an infinite light on, it'll render it whether there's a wall there or not. This is also the same with an area light. However, a spotlight and a regular light cohere to actual planes within, this, within the scene. So you can see that I have the light over here projecting the light this way along the axis. You can see that it hits off the object like this. The other light works with the same basic principle. So for the sake of this tutorial, I'll just leave this light on. So now let's talk about materials. So there's many ways you can make materials. You can load in a preset, which are basics. There's shaders that are basics too, which are just different types of materials. And then you can load in materials from outside your computer, from like the internet, or if some guy has a material packet posted on the internet, you can get from there. So let's just pick a new material and double click it to open up the material editor. You can load in textures from outside. So if I want to load an image in, like let's say if I want to have my cat be on the cube, I'll load in my cat. I can also add colors. I can add a thing called a Fresnel, which is essentially like a sideways gradient. And there's also noise, which you guys know is just static. And there's tons and tons of different types of things you can add to this. So let's just clear that for now and stick with basic colors. Now, if you double click this, you can change the actual color of this. There's, if you guys know anything about changing colors, you can change the RGB scale of all of this. So I'll just make this one red for now. No, I'll make it yellow. And then there's a whole multitude of things that you can apply to this. Now you see that specular, specular is automatically turned on. What this does is it gives like a weighty feel to the object. It gives the object sort of a graininess to it. You can change it from like a plasticky look to a metal look to a colored look. I don't really like how well this works normally so I just normally turn this off. And there's glow which if you turn that on it makes the object glow. There's displacement which can change the actual shape of the texture on the object. There's alpha which can which essentially just renders the object and makes the background clear so if you want to have it overlaid on top of something then you can work it that way there's normal there's bumps which allows you to load in outside textures environment and fog are closely linked um, all fog is just, it's just as the name sounds it makes the object sort of transparent but opaque at the same time there's reflections there's transparency And then there's luminance, which is good for making soft boxes, but not much else. But that's all we're really going to need to concern ourselves with for now. So let's just exit out of the material editor. And you've got our first material. Also, let's just name this test texture. 
And there's actually a couple different ways of getting the texture onto the object, but the simplest one is just dragging it on and dropping it, and that applies to the next thing right there. Now let's say you've got three or four different cubes in your scene, and they're all scattered about like such and such, like this. And it's a whole mess and you don't know what the heck's going on, but you want all your objects to move at the same time. What it is, you can group these objects by right-clicking them after selecting them all, and you go to down here to group objects. And you name the group. And there you go. And if you don't want this group anymore, if you want to take all these objects back out of the group, what you do is you right-click the group and you click delete without children, and the group's gone. And if, let's say, if you don't like where this cube is, you can actually turn it off. These little check marks next to it, you can turn them all off and on, or all on and off. Alright, so we've got our basic render product here, and let's say we're happy with the result, and we want to export it. What you're going to do is just double check your render settings. Make sure it's, it's exporting to this location you want and the file type that you want. And the output is within the right is with the the size and the, all the frames that you want. So I only have objects going moving around for the first hundred frames. So I'm just going to render the first hundred frames of this. And like I said here, this is one way to render your to want to render your uh, final animation. But the easier way is to go to your render tab, add to render queue, click yes to saving your project, and right click and start rendering. This is a lot less CPU intensive than the other one, which gives you a full screen view of the graphic as it's rendering. And I'll just wait for this to finish rendering real quick. And then we can watch the final product. Normally if you have more objects in the scene or if the texture is more elaborate, it takes longer to render. So we'll navigate to the project, go to my renders folder, and watch the video. And there we go. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the, in the comments, and make sure to like and subscribe.